Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Morales. I'm the editor of Live in Italy magazine, and I want to welcome you back to our interviews. And today we have a special guest, Rafael Di Furia, who is li living in the Veneto region. Oh, it's a, such a pleasure. Um, me personally, I have been trying to watch as many as your videos as possible. <laughs> I believe that happens every Friday. Uh, correct? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, uh, the, the schedule is aimed for Fridays every once in a while. A little extra something comes out on top of that. And I must say, because I've done quite a bit of searching, uh, obviously being in the United States and wanting to kind of keep in touch with Italy, uh, there is not yet one unanswered question. So anybody who is thinking about moving to Italy, wanting to know what the experience is, um, uh, anything you want to know, uh, Raphael is your source. And we'll talk about later uh, where to find him. Uh, plus, it's very entertaining and just a really great slice of life. So, Raphael, I would love uh, to get to know you a little bit. Um, obviously, you are living in Italy. Uh, so, tell us, where did you grow up? So, I grew up uh, between uh, California and Washington State and uh, near San Francisco and near Seattle. Uh, and then I ended up leaving America at the age of 17, traveled around for a long time, and ended up finding myself in the land of my ancestors. That's great. And and we'd like to to have a bit of history on that. So obviously, because I know your channel is NYAG, which is not your average globe trotter. So you just let us know that you've been globe trotting for a while before getting to Italy. Uh, how many years have you been there now? So now in Italy, I guess it is just about three and a half years, a little bit over three and a half years that I've been living here full time, uh, growing up we did come here a, a number of times uh, just on little vacations, but I always knew that this was the place that I wanted to end up actually living. Okay, so let's backtrack a bit. Uh, tell us some of the, the things, the incident steps that got you there. Uh, so the way that I actually, it's okay, so it's a, a little long story, but the short version is that when I was about 12 years old, I, I think it was about uh, the early evening news, and I happened to hear something about Ital uh, Irish citizenship. And a, a family friend had recently gotten Irish citizenship by descent. And I just figured, well, if Irish people can do it, then why can't Italian people do it? Ends up that not everybody in the world has this ability to get a citizenship through their, through their line of descent. But it just so happens that Italy is one of these few countries um, that it would be possible to do this through. And growing up, my Italian heritage was something that was always very well known. Like our, our family is like, this is who we are. This is what we are. Our family came from Italy. We, uh, my grandfather especially was very proud of his heritage. And uh, growing up, he was my father figure. And so his influence on my life very much um, made an impact in having a love for a land that I had never known myself over time developed this desire to get to actually know it for myself rather than secondhand or third hand through different stories growing up. Um, I mean, cause I can remember even sitting on my grandfather's lap, uh, like very, very little, he would be telling me about um, a, a uh, injury that he had on one of his fingers because uh, when he was growing up, they used to, to smash the grapes uh, in his, in his basement uh, for wine. And that was just, that was something that he lived with. That was just his little thing. Um, and there were other little cultural things that ended up coming up there that I only realized maybe later that were very much a part of this Italian influence on my life. And so to get to know the country better was, and the culture and the peoples, because Italy is not just one place with one people. It's a single country with a lot of different places and a lot of different kinds of people um, that are very culturally different from one another. And that's something I've been blessed to be able to get to know throughout this time here. Yeah, that's so great. And I imagine it will continue to. And that's one thing that um, we're finding interviewing Italians is very much a regional thing. Uh, you know, it just can't, uh, you know, maybe 
Italian Americans might think of, you know, just one Italy, what they know, but if you're actually mm -hmm. with Italians, um, it's very much a regional thing and so many different oh, cultures and dialects even, right? Oh, very much so. I, where I live, I have a very difficult time understanding the way that they speak. Now I can understand little bits and pieces um, because some of it actually gets a little bit similar to Spanish and Portuguese. But there are, there are dialects in Italian that I really don't understand. Anything for me south of Rome, I find very difficult to understand. Um, anything in the northern part of the country is a, generally a bit easier. Um, and once you start spending more time here and having more exposure to people, you start to hear the differences between the, the um, dialects and also the accents. Uh, so even when I try to speak to someone from Naples or Palermo, for example, if they're actually speaking in Italian and not their own local dialect, I can still have issues trying to understand them because of the pronunciation differences. Even um, an example I think I've used in my videos on my YouTube channel is when I was in Palermo, uh, I had arrived there, I would say about eight in the evening, it was already dark, and I was not quite hungry and ready for dinner yet, but I was wanting to get a lay of the land just in case things would close early. And across from the, the pensione where I was staying, literally across the street, there was this little rotisserie chicken place, which you can find all over Italy, and they're so good, and I was thinking, ah, okay, a good protein dinner, why not? I'll eat a chicken, just go for it. Um, and I walked into the place, and I asked the guy in, my Italian, which is not perfect, I said, like, what time do you close? And he just said, but the Aladij. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> and he said, Aladij. I'm like, excuse me? I'm like, can you repeat that just a little bit slower? I don't think I'm understanding what you're saying. He entered in a, a word that I, I would prefer not to say here because it doesn't translate so nice to English, but he said, um, Aladij. For me, Alijechi, but he was starting to respond Alijech. And for me, just with my exposure to Northern Italian and very little to Sicilian or Southern Italian, I just didn't know to even listen for the J instead of the Ch. Very interesting and kind of intimidating. Because oh, <laughs> I'm trying to learn a bit of Italian. <laughs> oh, oh, no, well. that's the thing. <laughs> I've mentioned this in one of my videos that I am almost convinced now that you can learn Italian, you can come to Italy and never speak Italian. <laughs> that wow. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a country where there is an official language, but nobody speaks it. No, I mean, if you're in the larger cities, you definitely will hear more people um, and have more uh, people that are speaking to you in Italian, like actual Italian. But even where I live, I can have a little bit of difficulty to um, communicate with some of the older generations because mm. they never learned Italian or they only partially or improperly learned Italian. And even if they are speaking in Italian, the accent can be very difficult for me to understand. There was uh, a, uh, in the, the building that I was living uh, not too long ago, just before moving into the apartment that I'm in now, I had to contact a building manager there. And there was just a repair that needed to be done. And I'm talking to this guy. The more that he's talking, the more I'm realizing I have no clue what he's saying. And it ended up getting to the point where I said, I'm so sorry, I'm not understanding you. Do you have WhatsApp? Can we continue this conversation through WhatsApp? Because I didn't want to say like, I didn't want to offend him. Like because of your accent, I can't understand you because uh. he's the native speaker, not me. <laughs> Oh, that's crazy. Well, I mean, that's a good experience, but it just goes to show again how we're talking about there's just so many um, regional differences. So, mm -hmm. uh, so keep keep at it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm sure it'll come. No, we'll and that's the thing for anybody. They have to keep they have to keep pushing forward. Moving abroad yeah. doesn't mean that everything's going to be sunshines, rainbow, rainbows, and unicorns. There's there is a bit of a. Uh, a struggle at times, but sometimes that struggle is part of the experience and, and can really enrich the experience overall. Oh, definitely. I totally agree with you. It's an adventure. So I just wanted to ask you then, so are you an Italian citizen? And I'm presuming because of your heritage, I think it's, yes. it's called Italian citizen by descent. 
Is yeah, right? Italian, Italian citizenship by descent is the general term used in English. Um, it, in Italian is borrowed from Latin, iure sanguinis or ius sanguinis by way of blood or through blood. Um, that because my ancestors were Italian citizens, because of that blood, that heritage, that um, ethnicity, uh, that's allowed me to come and return to this country uh, the, as a, and uh, you could even say repatriate uh, rather than become an expat. Which I think is a very interesting movement um, because, you know, if you go back a century it, or more, it was the mm -hmm. other way around. So I think it's kind of nice to think that maybe there are more younger people or young retirees who are Italian by descent who want to go back and contribute to the country. Oh, definitely. I, that, that's one of the reasons why I'm here, to be able to become a functioning member of society and kind of almost maybe pick up where my ancestors left off. I know I have this feeling and a number of my subscribers that I've spoken with have this feeling that they, if given the choice, they would not have been born abroad, like that they would have, if their had, family had stayed here, they would have continued to actually living their, live their lives here. I, I know mm -hmm. it's a, a strange idea, but uh, there are a lot of people, and I think it's not just among the Italian diaspora, people who are Italian American, Italian Australian, Italian Brazilian, Uruguayan, uh, whatever it may be, um, but there are a lot of people in this day and age that are looking for a sense of identity, I think, uh, and mm -hmm. even beyond a sense of identity, but maybe a place where they feel could be the right choice for their life and to make a family. And so even you, I've seen um, a lot of people of African descent looking at going back to Africa and actually have made that decision to jump back to whatever country it is that they are connected with or um, I've talked to um, people who are connected with Poland, with Spain, with Portugal. There are a lot of countries now where these people have this ancestry from that they're looking to reconnect with because they know it's part of them, but they don't know exactly how they're connected with it and how they can make it part of their life in a practical sense. Sure, I would kind of say it's um, turning the myth into reality because like you said, you have all these memories as a child and these experiences, but to actually go and live it yourself, not just visit it, um, must be just a great experience for anybody who wants to do that and connect oh, with definitely. their roots. Yeah. Definitely. There's, there's something about hearing about this place over there at that time with those people who were old and you just, you, you get a picture in your head, but you don't get the feeling for it. But then you go and you're physically there and you get a real sense of how the scale even like to understand what the Colosseum, for example, how big it is or how small it is mm -hmm. or the village maybe where your family came from. And was it the, this little idea that you had in the back of my, your mind or was it something completely different? So um, what area of Italy were you, uh, you know, your, I guess your paternal and maternal grandparents from? So my family uh, has roots in um, Campania and Puglia. And uh, I actually have to admit that I haven't had the time to get down to where my family is from yet. That's something that's been on my list for a very long time, but um, just. Oh, that will be really great because yeah. there's the perfect example that whatever might be in your imagination, or even if some photos exist, no, that you'll exactly. be able to see uh, for yourself. That's exciting. No, exactly. Exa no, and that's something that, that, that really gets me because I've seen quite a bit of the north of Italy, but I, like I said, I don't have that much experience um, personally in the south. Like I have a little bit, and I know a lot of people from there, but uh, there are definitely, definitely different places. And, uh, to be able to explore that, I, it will be a very big treat as soon as that gets to happen. I was planning to do that actually in 2020, but of course, because of the yeah. uh, <laughs> events of the year, so to speak, um, yeah. that wasn't possible. Well, hopefully really soon. That, that's what mm. we all hope. And, and yes. I'm sure there will be a, a video once that happens. So we'll have a way Definitely. to <laughs> know more about your experience. So <laughs> I just wanna go back to the Italian, uh, Italian citizen by descent. Maybe sure. this is not a short answer question, but um, very maybe, few answers are in regards yes. to that subject. <laughs> <laughs> More or less, um, I guess you could cover how long did it take and was it complicated? Because one thing that's always coming up is kind of the, the bureaucratic process is sometimes sure. very long and drawn out, frustrating. So 
So my situation is very non-typical, very atypical within this community. Um, for me, from start to finish, it was 14 years. Normally, for most people, it would be anywhere from like the actual processing side, um, or sorry, document gathering plus processing could be anywhere from say about maybe if it, this used to be more common in the past, less so now, maybe starting at around six months now, maybe say starting at around a year to about two to three years, really depending on where you, where you make your application or your, uh, you actually present your, not application, but a petition. Um, and it depends on whether you're actually making a petition through descent, through um, a female who gave birth to their child after 1948, or if you're doing it through your, your male ancestry. Um, and so my case was that I got all the documents, got everything going, and I was ready to present them. And I went and they said, nope, you, you, you don't have all the, the documents that you need. You need A, B, and C. So I was like, okay, fine. I'll go get A, B, and C. Um, it ended up taking a little while. And uh, I went there a couple years later and presented my documents again. They're like, no, 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 no. You have ABC. What you really need is actually X, Y, and Z. I was like, okay, oh, no. fine. And this was actually a really great introduction to the uh, Italian bureaucratic system. <laughs> you get a very good taste of it when you're going through, through this process. Um, and then so I got X, Y, and Z. And then I went back and they said, oh, no, that was the old person who used to work here. They didn't understand it correctly. You really actually needed A, B, and C. And so I had A, B, and C originally from the beginning, but be going through the process of getting X, Y, and Z, I had to get these documents modified, amended, this, that, and the other. Um, and then in the end, it wasn't even A, B, C, or X, Y, and Z that I needed. It was D, E, and F. And so <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> but you beat me to it. <laughs> No, but really, that's what it came down to. And uh, in the end, it just was because we had started this, like right when I had found out about this when I was 12, uh, I told my mother about it as soon as uh, as soon as I found out about it. And I know she, at the time she had been thinking about moving her business from the US to Europe. And the plan originally was that I would end up going to high school um, here in Italy. But because of it getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back, it just ended up never ended up happening. And so when I finally um, uh, got to that time where I was leaving America, I was like, okay, maybe I'll just travel around for like a year, two years. <laughs> and uh, just it ended up getting pushed back and pushed back. And then finally, as soon as it happened, I happened to be at a point in my life where I was able to just say, okay, you know what? This is the time. It's either kind of now or never let's take this jump and just push on forward. And so I, as soon as I got my Italian passport, later that day, I went to get a ticket uh, when it old, went at the old fashioned way of going to a travel agent, because it actually happened to be a cheaper option than going to buy it directly through the company. And uh, a month later, I was here in Italy. Wow. That's an exciting story. And long and drawn out but by the smile on your face i would say uh totally worth it <laughs> oh yeah yeah no definitely yeah <laughs> it, to, to finally realize a, a lifelong dream and to be able to get that weight off of your shoulders is a sure. an immense feeling especially having lived on visas for a number of years traveling around it ends up becoming a stress in the back of your mind that you're wondering Will you be legal? Will you be illegal? Will you mm -hmm. be able to continue mm -hmm. living in that country? Have you, have, will everything that you've built up in this place be just all going to the wayside and just be a waste if you can't renew that visa? And so to have that feeling of being able to be in a country as a citizen without limits, as if I were back in the United States, has been a very... Um, um, I'm losing my English here, I swear. <laughs> it's been a relief. It's very much been a relief to have that just not in the back of my mind every day. And sometimes I'll just sit at my desk or, or walk through the town. I'll realize, oh, wait, yeah, I'm here. I can just exist. I don't have to think about the legal side of things. I can just right. continue walking down the right. street without having to think about what tomorrow might look like. Well, at least in the sense of a visa. <laughs> 
no, I, I think that's a big peace of mind. And that's something that we're discovering through other people who have moved it or planning on moving is that you really have to look into all the ins and outs. And we won't get into that today because uh, you know that, but we do encourage people to really do their homework and yeah, to be it's patient. It's very important. It'll save mm -hmm. you a lot of headaches down the line. Right. I, I can't even tell sure. you how many people I've spoken to have been through such difficult situations because they didn't find out the basic information before really putting everything into this new experience that they were going to um, invest themselves into. Right. So um, did you speak Italian growing up? Uh, do you speak Italian now? How's it going? <laughs> oh, my <laughs> Besides Italian. Besides the dialect. <laughs> <laughs> no, so uh, I'll admit my Italian is, is not the best. I can get around for basic things um, and I can have basic conversations. I still struggle with being able to fully express myself the way that I can in English. And that's something that if I never get to that level, I'm also okay with as long as I have the ability to be understood for the, the daily necessities or mm -hmm. um, to have like a basic conversation with someone that is totally fine with me. Um, of course, I am looking to improve my Italian, but uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult process, I would say, because I'm also somebody who does not enjoy sitting in a classroom and learning all of the grammatic uh, mm -hmm. rules and uh, because there's a difference sometimes between the way you see the language written in a book and uh, the language that you actually end up using in day to day life. And right. so for me, even though it's a longer, more drawn out process, I prefer to have a complete crash course and try to learn it on the street. Yeah, I mean, for survival purposes, I mean, that is the best way. And, and the rest will come in time uh, if, mm. if you want it. So Definitely. you're there now. Um, and obviously, you know, I discovered you on YouTube and many other people have. So, so uh, tell us a little bit about this channel and, and what you're doing in Italy professionally, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, so um, with the whole YouTube channel, uh, it's youtube.com slash Rafael Di Furia. Mm -hmm. And this Not Your Average Globetrotter process kind of, uh, not process, project, uh, started out of uh, my own needs uh, because I was originally looking for a lot of information about living abroad in a number of different countries and especially about Italy and some of the legal processes here and some of the things that you have to go through and the hoops that you have to jump through. And at the time when I was looking for that information, there wasn't a whole lot out there. And uh, especially about life in Italy, you can find some videos about this, but it was mainly from a female perspective. And I'm not discounting that at all, but sometimes you want to hear what a guy, another guy's experience is, just so that you have maybe a little bit of a different point of reference. Um, right. but it, it was interesting to later on see that there were a couple of guys who ended up making content on YouTube and to hear their experiences about it. But, um, that was already kind of after I started my, my YouTube channel. Um, and so I decided that I wanted to make content for that person who was looking for the same information that I was looking for at that point in time and to help both men and women, not just men here, um, with the various processes that you need to look into. And uh, so I've made content about like how to get the uh, medical card, health insurance here, um, a, a lot of content about Italian dual citizenship. And that even actually led into um, developing a project uh, separately from my YouTube channel uh, called the Italian Citizenship Podcast and actually devoting only content to that and so that these so that people who are looking for that information in video form because it's not everybody is the type of person uh i'm really talking about myself here that is enjoys reading through um information and can be nice to have a face behind some information especially if it's sure. well presented um uh to try and keep you engaged during that time. So that's something that I try to do with my content is to present a lot of information in some of the more podcast style videos um, and try to take away some of the dryness. A lot of these subjects can be very dry, um, but uh, 
even when I get out and I do my videos out and about showing Italy, because there's more than just the the legal side of coming to Italy, more than just these practical things, because those are those are the foundation. What people really want to come here for is the uh, pizza, pasta, and amore, as I like to call yes, it, instead of the yes. dolce vita. It's because these are some of the things that really most people think about when they think about Italy, it's like they want to go there and try the pizza. They want to go and try the pasta. And many people would love to fall in, to find love or to fall in love here. And right. that definition of love, I'm not saying necessarily about a person, but to find that mm -hmm. love for this beautiful place or even to find their love for themselves in this age where we're getting so disconnected from others and even disconnected from ourselves to an extent right. that people are looking to find out what makes Italy Italy and why is this romanticized idea uh, the idea that we have about Italy I mean even if you look at the word romanticized or romantic mm -hmm. there's a good origin there yes, <laughs> the, the there is. <laughs> yes. no definitely and and um, I think with the philosophy of the magazine you know that this we're talking about we're not exactly saying you know, go live in Italy. Although there is there is that question that comes up, and you know, people, oh, yeah. you know, there's a put it this way, there's an art audience for that. But there's just mm -hmm. something about, and it doesn't necessarily have to be Italy, but you know, looking for that authentic lifestyle for yeah. something that you do love, and and bringing that into your life, whether it's actually in that place or where you are now. No, definitely. And there's a lot of people who end up watching my content that have absolutely no interest in Italian citizenship by descent because they're not of Italian descent mm -hmm. um, or they're not even interested in moving to Italy because they're just interested in learning about life abroad and what some of those struggles are, because there are some of these things, um, not even all even always struggles, but some of these things that you go through, some of these adjustments are always the same, no matter what country you decide to. And there's a lot of people who are interested in looking towards the outside and seeing what a foreign way of living can be. Uh, mm -hmm. Not necessarily because they're looking for their own practical experience, but just because there's something so different about it that, that it's, um, I can't even think of the words to, to really describe trying, uh, what I'm saying here, but to see something beyond the, the confines that they've been uh, raised within. Definitely. And um, looking back, like I said, I, I haven't watched every single video. <laughs> but no, that's, that's, I, that's completely I, that, that's understandable. Impossible. I don't expect any, it's, it's hours of content. I forget. I did the math on this a while ago and it's, it's a huge number. It's it, whatever. It doesn't even matter because there's anyway, there's like 170, 160 something episodes at this point in time, plus a bunch of other content that I've created. So I don't really expect that everybody has gone through all of my videos. Although I have to say there are actually a few people who have done that. Right. Well, I mean, we'll get into that at the end. You seem to have a lot of support and it seems to be growing quickly. But one thing I was going to say, I think one, one time um, recently you asked, what do you want to hear more about the COVID situation in Italy or my trip to uh, Sicily, <laughs> right? <laughs> and everybody was like, hey, desperate for travel here. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was kind of like, it, well, that was the thing. I had had this video for a while and it was actually something that I was looking to make more content around, but then of course 2020 happened. And um, so that pushed all of my plans way far back. Uh, completely canceled a bunch of plans, including for work and various uh, various aspects of my life. But I was like, okay, I've got this video. Maybe this week, instead of something really heavy, because I've been doing a lot of updates in English about um, what's been going on here. And even I do get a number of Italians who watch my videos because it's so confusing and complicated what the government puts out here that they even local people who are native Italian speakers can have a difficult time trying to understand. So there's a couple of people who've contacted me saying, thank you. I'm an Italian. And even this doesn't make sense to me. And I'm like, I'm not saying this makes sense to me either. I just present the information yeah. that I see and from, from various sources. Um, but it's just, it's, it's been definitely a journey to see how that that's kind of all come together. <laughs> That's great. And it is a journey and, and uh, you'll evolve with it. So I wanted to ask because, mm. and it's really funny because the first time I heard your voice, I was like, wow, what a voice. Like I'm waiting for, you know, it's that, you know, 
nine o'clock p.m on the radio and then you're going to switch <laughs> up some jazz tunes so <laughs> and but then i realized live. okay it's not just me i've seen it in your comments yes yeah. <laughs> so now we're gonna I mean, play I don't some know, i don't know if you've been spinning the tunes but uh, do you have a background I spin them for myself <laughs> <laughs> yeah you've got a guitar in the background there so um so broadcast journalism I, have you worked in that field uh, yeah, so I actually have worked in that field, but behind the scenes. Um, mm -hmm. I've worked in television and broadcast, video production, uh, a number of different fields uh, related to video. And uh, the thing was, I was always the guy either behind the camera or directing the show uh, or directing the broadcast, live stream, whatever it was. Um, but on the side, I also have done some voiceover work, um, a little bit of acting here and there. But uh, as far as the voice goes, most of it gets used on online in, in my projects. <laughs> right, right. And, and um, you can just tell us briefly, you do have a podcast pro project with Italian Citizenship Assistance. Yeah, so I uh, am part of two other projects currently. One is called the Italian Citizenship Podcast um, that's presented by ItalianCitizenshipAssistance.com. And the other one is Italian, uh, the Italian Real Estate Podcast presented by ItalianRealEstateLawyers.com. And they're actually sister companies uh, that mm -hmm. work together, um, but are still quite separate in some ways. And I work uh, on that project with an Italian attorney called Marco Permunian. And he is a wealth of information. And he is somebody who ended up getting uh, in contact with me after he had seen some of my videos. Um, and we'd become friends. And uh, that, that, that friendship ended up continuing uh, and us having a number of conversations and saying, hey, well, look, I have this skill set and you are an authority on this matter why don't we share this information? Because we both have a, a, a standpoint that we both believe that none of this information should be hoarded or kept um, behind uh, um, uh, a paywall, that this information is publicly available, but there are right. a lot of people who try to hide it. Um, and so we thought, well, why not at least try this? And we are here now. I guess a little bit more than a year later into the project. And it's just, it's, it's been very, very, um, it's something that I really wish I had had in the access to when I was going through this process. Uh, even in my own videos, I was talking yes. to some family members and who were watching my videos recently saying that if we had had this when we were going through the processes for Italian citizenship and so on, that would have helped us so much. And so that's, again, getting back to one of your earlier questions, one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about getting this information out there, because it's out there, but it's difficult to find and it can be very confusing to find. Um, and there are a lot of people who do try to put it behind um, a service that you have to pay for, which I think right. there is a time and place for. I'm not, I'm not knocking that. Um, mm -hmm. because sometimes assistance is required with certain things. Um, but to actually be able to have the information out there um, as a library of content resource for people I know is very helpful. Yes, and this has come up. Um, we, we had a previous interview uh, with, with a realtor uh, in Italy, and I think this is some of the things that we've been presented with is the, you know, I believe especially when it comes to purchasing real estate. And of course we're focusing on Italy, but this could be mm -hmm. anything. There's got to be um, a certain degree of transparency and accessibility oh, that as soon as, uh, soon as something seems a little bit obscure, you're going to lose people that way. And, and oh, obviously, um, you know, people are needing that and, and that's a great resource. And, and I think I, I watched uh, you, you were recently in Rome and, and, and covering, of that subject. So um, we we talked before we actually did this interview a little bit, and something that I'm very curious about. We just posted an article on, and something that is kind of I don't know in the last I would say year and a half, a very popular topic. And although this is not your expertise, I just mm -hmm. want to ask you today your personal sure. opinion about the one euro home. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Give us your opinion. <laughs> okay, so personally, I would never be interested in it. 
Um, yes. And there's I a video, think, I will add, we'll add thank that you. link thank as well. You. There's, um, yeah, there's a, at least one video on my channel and one or two on the podcast, the Italian real estate podcast that I'm a part of where we spoke about this subject and where I've spoken about this subject. Um, on my channel, I kind of come at it more from the perspective of somebody who is just a regular guy and what I would do in that situation. Um, for some people, I, I'm just going to preface what, what I'm saying here because I'm, I don't have a negative opinion about it, but uh, I don't have the most positive opinion about it uh, mm -hmm. because it's definitely not for me. So what I'll preface this by um, is saying that I know there are a lot of people who have taken part in these projects, but that, um, and they love it. They, they are so happy with their homes and they're very glad that they made these decisions to, to take part in this. But when we're talking about one euro homes, we're not talking about homes that are, okay, so it depends on the municipality because it, mm -hmm. it, in each municipality, they have their own program and own way of doing it. And in many places, you will find that the homes aren't actually at one euro. One euro is the starting opening bid. And many of these homes can go anywhere from a few thousand to 20 or 30,000 euros for a dilapidated home that's completely in ruins in many cases. Um, most of these homes are generally very poorly taken care of or not being taken care of. And that's why the municipalities are trying to get rid of them for low cost. Um, mm -hmm. But then on top, you're also making a uh, commitment to the municipality to actually renovate the home and to take care of it. Some, some municipalities now are having a, 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 a a residence clause, but the, the, those are few and far between from what I've seen. And so at the end of the day, from the people that I've spoken with, you can end up getting a home that you thought would be a Euro and really cheap to move into um, for at the end, final costs could be anywhere. For, most of the people I've spoken to say around 30 to 80,000 euros. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so I think the deal is, in some ways a lot better for the municipalities that put them on. Um, but the thing is you also have to take into consider that a lot of these places are very far out. There's reasons why these homes aren't being lived in. Mm -hmm. And there are reasons why they have fallen into disrepair. And so the reasons why they've been, uh, people have been leaving these places is because many of them aren't either a easily accessible or um, they are, a combination of not easily accessible and very far from anything uh, fun to do or big cities or anywhere where young people can work. And so that's why a lot of young people have, have uh, fallen away from these places. And I feel horrible for saying this, that I, 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 that I would have a difficult time doing it myself because I would love to see these places thrive. Um, and, but there are definitely, is, there's a type of person who is looking for getting mm -hmm. out and getting into a place and having this type of project. But for some of the virality and some of the viral interest, especially that's come from um, CNN and other major outlets, uh, it's been people thinking, oh, I can go buy a home and I can just move in there for a right. euro or a couple of euros. Um, and the thing is, some of these places also, they don't have electricity, they don't have water, mm -hmm. they don't have these basic, well, things that now in the modern area, era, we would um, consider as necessities. Right. Uh, some of these towns don't even have high-speed internet, some do, some yeah. don't. It, it really just depends because there are a lot of places that are offering these. Um, but if we're talking about the, amount, the final total sum that you could spend mm -hmm. on one of these places, you could come to an area like where I live uh, in the north of Italy in a place that's much better connected. Like the town that I live in uh, is, I think, around 40,000 people. And I can be in Venice in about an hour, Rome, uh, sorry, Florence in about an hour and a half, Florence in, sorry, <laughs> Florence, hour and a half, Rome, three hours, Naples, about four and a half, five hours, and Milan probably around four-ish hours or so. And that's only on public transportation on the, on the yeah. train here. That's not even having a car. Excellent. Um, and you, so it, it, where I live is a very well-connected place in regards of the country as a whole. Um, and I have high-speed fiber internet here. And you can find homes in this town that are in the hundreds of thousands. However, you can find a home that is ready to move into anywhere from, say, 
thirty or forty thousand up until about maybe ninety thousand, a hundred thousand, one hundred twenty thousand, which is still within the ballpark of what some people have spent to renovate their homes in some of these one year home towns. So I think that's something that a person may also want to take into consideration that you don't have to get yourself invested into one of these projects where you will have to, in most or many cases, work with a contractor that is, has been approved by that village. So you only, you, you can't go and shop for, for different choices for different right. prices and price things out. You have the one person or maybe two people, if you're lucky, um, mm -hmm. that are approved that can actually make these renovations. Um, whereas if you're just ready to kind of just hop into a new life, you can buy one of these other places at the end of the day for kind of a similar price. So personally, even if the place isn't perfect, at least I could move in there. And that's why I would be more interested in looking at a place maybe just outside of a major city where yes. the prices can be comparable. Um, even though you do find in some of these other towns, maybe a finished place that is still quite affordable. I would prefer looking at a place that is still in the same kind of budget, but has more access. No, definitely. And, and uh, I really appreciate your, your genuine feedback on that. And Thank yes, you. I mean, anybody who wants to, we're definitely not trying to discourage you, but it's another uh, scenario, which you really need to, do, you know, don't get um, caught up in the hype and the national news. You need to, to go and, and, you know, maybe even stay there, see what it's like. Um, because, uh, you know, you need, you need to be very comfortable with the fact that, not only the condition of the home or the amount of money or you know how it's going to be restored but also you're in a very remote area and uh you can like culture. Uh, like you're saying Raphael is and we'll get into that you're you're in uh, an area you just said that you can get a lot of places Rovigo right um mm. is is a smaller city or town or uh but close technically to, a city but i would call it a town <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, no, but uh, you're, you're, you're very right that it's worth looking into because for some people it is worthwhile these that it can be they are they do have that kind of in them that they want to be managing a project and really start from nothing and end up with mm -hmm. something beautiful. And I think that is definitely an amazing thing. And I really have respect for people who do that. Um, but you raised a very good point that you really should visit these places before uh, you should try before you buy really to put it simply even I have a, a realtor friend from a, another part of the country who said something to me that I will never forget and it's made a lot of sense on uh, looking back on my life and even um, some of my more recent experiences that you should really live in a place for at least two years maybe even three years before you consider investing in it if it, you're looking at it as a place that you would like to live in. Um, in Italy, a short-term contract in two years, three years would be short um, in Italy can be difficult to find. But to have that experience, you really get a feel at the end of even say first year and a half of what that place will look like within your life, what your life could be there. Um, you'll find your butcher, your supermarket, your what is your daily life going to look like? And there mm -hmm. are some of these places where, especially for younger people who are looking for a bit more action, um, a smaller town life might not actually be the best option for them. And that goes for any country, any place where you are, even if you're going to stay in the United States. Um, Although in the United States, of course, there's a different mentality towards how long you stay in a place for us, a long-term contract, one, two years, whereas here in Italy, mm -hmm. that's a very short-term contract. Um, but to be able to get a really good sense of that place first, I think is very vital. Um, and I know I can say after having lived in some places for roughly that amount of time, it really showed me that it wouldn't be the right place, that if I get to that point, at some point in my life when I'm able to... Um, finally purchase a place uh, that I wouldn't want to purchase there. And to, even though when I first arrived there, it was like, wow, this is a dream. This is amazing. This is exactly what I would love for my life. After that little bit of time, things start to change or they can change. Yeah. So you don't know yet if this is the place that you want to settle in. In Rovigo, it's the place that I'm definitely happy to be at this point in my life. And, right. uh, I've got a good 
Italian term contract for the apartment. So I'm here for, for the next little while uh, or quite a while. <laughs> Hold on, what's um, an Italian term contract? Okay, so in Not Italy, a year. <laughs> no, uh, that would be a short term rental here in Italy. Yeah. Um, up to 18 months would be called like a transitional or transitory contract, generally speaking. And those can be difficult to find. Most uh, landlords in Italy are looking for a contract that is either three plus two years or three mm. plus three years or four plus four years. Those are the most normal term contracts that I've seen. Three plus three is maybe a little bit less normal. Normally three plus two or four plus four. Um, and what the, the four plus four or three plus two is that you sign a, um, a three year contract the, uh, and then six mo months before the end of that, or generally speaking, because it depends on the contract, depends on the, the, the landlord. Um, about six months before that, you'll have to tell them, do you want to renew that contract for another two years or four years, whatever the contract terms say. Um, and so basically you are in some respects actually committing to a five year or eight year chunk of time. Um, but, uh, it ends up being broken down. And of course you still in most con, I mean, you have to have in I think all contracts, a, um, legal out of the contract, but you have to have like actual, like a good reason for why you need to break that contract. And normally speaking, um, that, uh, instead of giving a month's notice for breaking your contract, like you might in the United States, um, uh, at least when you're on a longer normal term contract, mm -hmm. uh, here in Italy, that would normally be about six months of notice that you have to give for a rental which for even for myself, it's like, well, <laughs> six months from now, I don't know what my life is going to look like. I mean, it's like, if I want to leave, I want to leave now. Um, I was lucky in the place when I first moved to Italy, uh, in the Alto Adige region, uh, otherwise known as Südtirol, um, mm -hmm. where they are more German uh, or Austrian, a complicated discussion there, um, <laughs> where because of the, um, the, region it's got a very high demand because work there's more work there so it's got a very high demand for rent it's very much an owner's market in that area so i was able to uh, uh get out of my contract because i was able to get somebody into my contract or into a new contract for the landlord i was able to handle that uh partially myself with the help from a, a real estate uh, agent friend um but that's something also you want to take into consider that even when they're talking about these long-term contracts in italy they're also wanting you to have a work contract. So um, even for me, I don't have a normal work contract uh, or actually any work contract uh, because I mostly work freelance uh, for myself and for, for uh, a number of different clients around the world. Um, uh, so getting into apartment and apartment can be a little bit tricky, especially in a smaller town. Um, in larger cities though, you will find some of these one year rental contracts um, or, or transitory contracts. But the issue that you can run into is that um, in some of these shorter term uh, rentals, sometimes they're not even officially a contract. It's just kind of like, yeah, you pay me, you can be here kind of thing. Like let's mm -hmm. under the yeah. table, so to speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, that can actually lead to some issues if you are somebody who needs to have a legal residence in Italy. Um, right. Because residency in Italy is a very different concept than it is in the United States and many other countries where you actually have to go to the municipality and um, show them the contract for your apartment and mm -hmm. say, I am XYZ person living at ABC address. And they in Italy will actually come, they will send uh, a police officer to your home to come inspect and to see, in some cases, if there are sheets in your closets, if there are clothes in your closets, sheets on the bed, and uh, to see if the space is actually being lived in. Um, technically, they can do this more than one time. I've never had that experience where they uh, have come more than once, but uh, they will come and you'll have to show them your ID and actually you're making a legal um, statement that you are saying, I live here. And for mm -hmm. some types of residency, having um, a registered domicile can be very important. Um, again, this is one of those things that it's important to look into. Otherwise, it can cause you headaches um, down the road. And there are a lot of things in Italy that become very bureaucratic and sometimes a little overcomplicated. And that's just part of a different lifestyle and a different yeah. way of living. Um, yeah. But 
on the other hand, you get that payoff at the end of the day of the pizza pasta. <laughs> there you go. It's all about the choices and, and uh, nothing comes easy. It's a little bit of hard work and an adjustment for some people, but hey, in the end, if that's what you want, I uh, highly encourage it. So um, I wanted to get in a little bit about uh, you personally being uh, what, uh, you know, some people hate the term expat. Um, but we're just going to use it for this purpose. Um, sure, what's your personal definition of an expat? So, so for me personally, I would say that, yeah, you could call me an expat. You could call me a repat, a term that nobody uses. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Because I'm somebody who has this Italian citizenship and come back to this country where I do have a citizenship. Um, but I, I, there's also, there's a, a few kind of definitions. I think it definitely started more as a British term um, for a person who is uh, looking to escape the cold gray weather, de uh, more generally speaking, somebody who was a retiree who had made their wealth and was living quite comfortably in life, going to a country where they could live in the sun. Um, I know a lot of uh, British expats decided uh, to choose uh, the Costa del Sol, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> in Spain and uh, or even Portugal but over time I think that term has definitely become expanded upon and it's also come to be an all-encompassing term uh, that some people accept and some people don't accept um, as also um, immigrants or migrants because uh, it I would say it actually becomes a very complicated uh, discussion about uh what a what these terms are because some people even see the term expat as uh, a very like eth uh, white centric kind of term that mm -hmm. only mm -hmm. rich uh, wealthy white people see can be expats and they don't see anybody else who doesn't speak english is not um but then i would say that maybe for me personally that doesn't hold true necessarily uh because i'm even myself, like, <laughs> it depends on your definition of white, maybe only half white or maybe only a quarter white. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but without getting into the racial discussion, uh, there are some people that I know very well that they are from Brazil, Uruguay, or from um, Nigeria, and they see themselves as an expat because I think also part of the definition of expat comes into the way you live your lifestyle a little bit. Um, and trying to be that adventurous person living abroad uh, mm -hmm. to live that new lifestyle. But um, unfortunately, I would say very often expats don't necessarily embrace the new lifestyle and end up forming um, little pockets or bubbles uh, where they yes. live very much in their culture that they left. And so, yeah, I, 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 it's a very long answer to a very short question. <laughs> That's um, okay. Because there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of layers to it that a lot of people um, don't look at, choose to ignore, or um, aren't aware of. And so I would say it's a multifaceted, uh, kind of complicated issue to deal with. And for me, if we're saying that I live this expat lifestyle, that means that I'm living abroad, I'm living this dream, I am living in a different country than the country that I grew up in. I expatriated in some sense mm -hmm. away from that country. And so if you look at it from that sense of this word expatriation, um, more the definition of that word, then I think, okay, that fits a lot more people than what many people uh, kind of, uh, uh, use when they're talking about just the term expat because it's kind of come to have its own little meaning um anyway <laughs> i think i'm gonna leave it at that for now <laughs> I, I think that's great and um it, it's good to know and everybody and that's what we're finding out that's why i asked that question everybody has their their uh personal definition of what that mm -hmm. is so mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. becoming an expat or just somebody whatever you want to call it uh permanently uh moving somewhere else in this case Italy is there anything you miss that's a tricky one um I know most people's answer to this question is that they miss their family and their friends and yes I do miss my family and friends although a lot of my family has actually been leaving the United States um mm. I have very few uh of my relatives who are alive, there's fewer and fewer who live in the States. Um, and it's uh, really only on my mother's side anyway. <clears throat> uh, but 
I guess the things other than, because for me also, what I, what I ended up finding out, because I've lived abroad for about 11 years now, what I've really found that, because in the first years, it was very difficult. Uh, I really found myself missing or thinking I was missing the United States. But what I was really missing was the times and places and these, these, these feelings, these uh, moments to look back on. That's what I was missing, not necessarily the place itself. And I think that goes for many of us that we get, uh, that we, the older we get, the more that we think about the good old times or these times when we were a teenager right. or when we were a kid. And so I can't say that it's necessarily the United States that I miss, um, but maybe some little things that I miss. Um, Tacos, burritos, yes. <laughs> good old fashioned double that. bacon people, cheeseburgers. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I think I, I, at the end of the day, like I'm a simple guy with simple needs and I miss being able to get a good old fashioned taco from a truck uh, with, with some guy who's been sweating all day and just mixing the meat with his arm because he doesn't have a ladle and uh, or even going to a greasy spoon diner and getting a good old fashioned double bacon cheeseburger because one thing that I have found that after you live abroad for a while is that while you can find a good burger, a decent burger, I'll say, you just don't find the same kind of just little oomph behind that burger that you find in North America, especially the United States. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So for, yeah. yeah, so for me, it really kind of comes down to food. Yes, I have friends I miss. I have, do have family that I miss, but um I guess those things that I reach for a little bit more would be the food sometimes, even though sure. for somebody coming in to Italy, it's like, oh, that's ludicrous. How could you say you have such beautiful, amazing food in Italy? It's like, yeah, you, the food here is wonderful. It's amazing. Yeah. But I still have a, th a soft spot in my heart for a good old fashioned burger, taco or burrito. <laughs> but I tell you, that's why I love asking that question, because sometimes it's the simple, silliest thing. And we, and we don't think about that. And, and no. I think that's a great thing to think about if you are going to live abroad, is that just knowing that there will always be those little things. And, and I yeah. like what you said. It's like, and that's good too, to kind of make the separation when you do decide to change your lifestyle, that sometimes, um, it's just kind of like a, a moment in your life that really doesn't exist anymore. You can't really move back to that neighborhood and that time and place. So, so it's a sentimental uh, missing of something. So that's really good because it, it's not easy to change no. where you live. And I, th I no, think, um, I think uh, what, when you make the move, then coming from the United States or any of us who have had immigrant parents is that we understand, we really start to touch base with, with what that involves. It, it's mm -hmm. not as simple as just packing your bags and going. No, no, there's a lot of emotional packing that you also need to do and sure. self-realization and coming to understand certain things about yourself and even coming to accept certain things and taking that time. I mean, for me, especially 2020 was a year that I realized that there are certain things that I was missing from my life that I had when I was younger and to re-explore those things um, that I had always just kind of written off. It's like, well, I live abroad. Of course, I don't need that in my life anymore. But mm -hmm. maybe to allow yourself some of those things that, because so many people, when they decide to move abroad, they decide to also unknowingly cut off a part of themselves when they're trying to make this new life and embrace the new life. And the thing is, mm -hmm. you can embrace a new life abroad without ignoring yourself and who you are and your comforts, because it's very important to take into consideration what those comfortable areas are for you, but to also be willing to push past them sometimes, not all the time. Otherwise, you'll end up driving yourself crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Isn't that, that's good. That's really good advice. So um, just before we wrap it up, I wanted to say, because um, I'm finding that people are so passionate about Italy and, and obviously you have a lot of exploring to do. And we're hoping that soon you'll be able to do more just within Italy itself. Um, do you have that one special place maybe you've already seen or that one place you want to go? Oh, that's a tough one. Um... The thing is, it's tough for me to say that there's this one place that I would like to explore. Definitely, like the places where my family came from. But mm -hmm. really, I, I can't. I'm very excited to just to have the opportunity to explore more of Italy and to see more of this country, more experience, more of the cuisines that you can find around the country. Because you could literally spend your whole life in this country 
and searching and traveling around the whole place and barely scratch the surface. So maybe rather than taking the, a specific little place as a town, um, I would say the place that I'm very excited to explore more is Italy itself. Good. And you've got it. So, <laughs> so and that will happen. Literally at my doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe if we have this conversation uh, in a few years, you can say, oh, there's this one spot that I just love to get away. That's the, you know, mm. yeah, but yeah, yeah no, for now no. it's, it, you have some um, uncharted territory, right? So, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I love it. And uh, <laughs> again, so, um, so we, we will just kind of wrap it up. And like I always say, it's loud and clear. How can we find you? I know. So we want everybody else to know. So you can find me on my website, rafaeldifuria.com, R-A-F-A-E-L-D-I-F-U-R-I-A. -E -E if you type that into Google, you can usually find me. Um, you can also find me on youtube.com slash rafaeldifuria, instagram.com slash rafaeldifuria, or at rafaeldifuria. Twitter, it's the same thing, either slash or at rafaeldifuria. Facebook, also rafaeldifuria. Um and then you can also listen to the podcast or watch the video podcast that I'm a part of on youtube.com slash Italian citizenship assistance. If you type in either um, Italian real estate podcast or Italian citizenship podcast into Google, you should be able to find those as well. Right. And we encourage everybody to subscribe. We'll put all the links below. Um, there's, like just visit Raphael's website. There's if you love the pizza pasta amore, uh, you can get your mug. You could have it in front of you every single day as you get through the work day. Yes. <laughs> and uh, if you love his content, uh, we encourage you to become a um, a Patreon supporter. Thank you. I appreciate uh, that. So uh, once again, we are Live in Italy magazine. The website is www.liveinitalymagazine.com. And just like Raphael, we make it really easy. You just look up at Live in Italy Mag and you'll find us everywhere as well. So please make sure to follow both of us. So once again, I'm thrilled to have talked to you. Thank you so much, Lisa. It was great to be um, able to speak with you. And meet you this way. And maybe yeah, one day we've been in we'll contact for a little you. while now. It's, yes, it's, we have. It's been a long time coming. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time coming, but I'm really glad. And, and like I said, it'd be great to touch base with you again once definitely, you, you're settled definitely. in Italy and, and see how things are going. Um, so until so next now. time. Yes, until next time. Close it for us. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us again. We'll see you all next time. Later. Okay, great. Bye. <laughs>